The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I am your host, Thomas Nagley. With me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He is a traditional Catholic priest and also a member of the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. How are you? Doing well. Thanks good. for being here, Father. Absolutely. Good, good to be back with good you. Good to see you there. Uh, Father, we continue to receive uh, requests to comment on, on Francis's uh, latest encyclical. We kind of gave a, a very brief, very brief overview of it in our last program. But uh, over this past week, Father, have you had any more time to to dig into this anymore? Do you have any any further uh, thoughts or, or reflections to offer on Francis's latest encyclical? Well, I think so. Uh, it's a long one, yeah. as you know. We mentioned that last time: forty three thousand plus words, longer than the Book of Genesis. Yeah. Uh, you know, one would not be uh, far off the mark, I think, to think that this is Francis's sort of answer. It's like a counter genesis in a way to recreate a world. Something that struck me this past week is uh, references to a closed world as opposed to an open world. Hmm. And if you if you know as you do about George Soros and his uh, and his machinations, uh, he he. Uh, his effort is known as the open society. That's his goal, the open society. So when you hear Francis using that terminology, you know, the closed world as opposed, as opposed to an open world, um, it, it just uh, rings, uh, you know, of, of George Soros and Soros' ideas. And we know there is definitely collusion between the Vatican and George Soros. I mean, Soros is a big donor to the Jesuit order right now. Okay, we know he's bundled hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars into the Jesuit order to, um, to uh, just support finance their so-called activism, their leftist activism. So um, that's one thing about this, this uh, encyclical. It's, uh, it's, it's even it's been called a manifesto, like a worldly manifesto. And you see this in all of the post-conciliar Pontiffs, the popes of the Novus Ordo, because that's what they are. They're popes of the new order. Um, they all uh, concentrate in their writings on this world. They do not talk about saving souls for the next world. Right. Uh, their entire focus is on social or socialist justice and welfare in this world. Going back to John the 23rd, all the way through, this is where their focus is. Uh, like good masons, you know. This is very much very Masonic um, to concentrate on this world, a very pagan concept. But also, uh, Francis's uh, encyclical paragraph 277 is kind of interesting. He says here, The Church esteems the ways in which God works in other religions and, quote, rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these religions. She has a high regard for their manner of life and conduct, their precepts and doctrines, which often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all men and women. And this goes on, yet we Christians are very much aware that, quote, if the music of the gospel ceases to resonate in our very being, we will lose the joy born of compassion, the tender love born of trust, the capacity for reconciliation that has its source in our knowledge that we have been forgiven and sent forth. If the music of the gospel ceases to sound in our homes, our public squares, our workplaces, our political and financial life, then we will no longer hear the strains that challenge us to defend the dignity of every man and woman. Now, this is all very poetic, right? Yes. But uh, you notice he, he doesn't seem to talk about the doctrine or the dogma or the truths of the gospel so much, right? We have the, the, the music of the gospel, whatever that means. <laughs> yeah. He's also talking about the music of the Amazon and the, the music. Evidently, he wants to be led by some kind of muse. <clears throat> In this case, the muse is not a Catholic muse, certainly. But he ends that quote, and this is another example of how he 
Well, the new order pontiffs quote each other. They're constantly citing each other as though their church began with the advent of Vatican II. And, um, but he goes on in that paragraph and says, others drink from other sources. For us, the wellspring of human dignity and fraternity is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. From it, there arises, quote, for Christian thought and for the action of the church, the primacy given to relationship, primacy given to relationship, to the encounter with the sacred mystery of the other. So that's what we discover in the gospel. Wow. The sacred mystery of other people. To universal communion with the entire human family as a vocation of all. Now this is pure masonry. You know, this is just out and out masonry. And, um, you know, he sings the praises. He says, others drink from other wells. Well, this is the well from which we drink. So uh, not only is it masonry, but it's, it's just like the apotheosis of, 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 of modernism. It's exactly what modernism is all about. Uh, if Pope St. Pius X had come across this passage, he would have condemned it absolutely <laughs> as being the work of, a, of, of a, um, an out-and-out -out modernist lunatic. Actually, he would have condemned this absolutely. Uh, even George Terrell, even Alfred Loisy, you know, founders of uh, English and, and French modernism, would not have said something so, so outrageous as that, saying that this is what the gospel is all about. But Francis is saying it now, and uh, this is the tragedy of it all, that people are actually buying into this as though this is somehow Catholic, and it certainly is not. It's anti-Catholicism. It is exactly what St. Pius X condemned it to be. He said modernism is the complexest of all heresies, and the, the result of it would be to destroy all true religion, mm -hmm. because it redefines the very nature of faith. And you can find that expressed right in that paragraph. Father, is any of this very surprising, though? I mean, anyone who, who uh, has been following in any of Francis's uh, Novus Ordo papacy knows that, the, that, that he's an out-and-out -out modernist. Like you said, he's, he's kind of like the personification of, of modernism. Um, so does he say anything in here that's really striking or startling or surprising to anyone who, who knows uh, this man, who knows what's been going on with his papacy? I don't know that he says anything uh, that he hasn't said before, at least implicitly. I think his treatment of private property is derived from another principle of communal property, though, is, is uh, explicitating something that is much more in the direction, much more openly in the direction of Marxism, communism, yeah. socialism. Um, he, there's no doubt that he's, he's advocating socialism here. And, you know, this comes out a month before the elections, uh, presidential elections here in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. That's no accident. The timing is everything here. Right. I mean, he goes on after that one paragraph. He goes on to 278 and says this, called to take root in every place. The church has been present for centuries throughout the world, for that is what it means to be Catholic, quote unquote, Catholic. And here he redefines the term Catholic as something that the Catholic church has never, never limited the term Catholic to the fact that the church had actually taken root in every place. Catholic for the church means every single soul, past, present, and future. Every single human soul must be saved through the church because the church is the church that Christ established for the salvation of all mankind, even as Christ himself is the savior of all mankind. There is no other savior, right? No other name by which you must be saved. And certainly the church of Christ is the means by which that salvation must take place. So what Francis defines, he, he, he actually dumbs down the church. He dumbs down the word Catholic. Just mean, well, the church was most supposed to spread throughout the world. But you see, he's already saying that throughout the world there are also other religions, which are really, really admirable, right, in many ways. And others are drinking from other wells. As we're drinking from this well, they're drinking from that well. I mean, he's virtually come out and said that other religions are means of salvation, and God positively wills them as something positively good. That's, that's heretical. That's out and out heresy. So, um, yeah, I, I, Francis is basically just driving, uh, well, this time though, instead of driving more nails into the casket, he's actually got at the nail gun. Okay, he's actually uh, gotten out the nail gun and he's going to town. 
And it's as though he's driving every nail he can think of uh, into that coffin. Father, you, you mentioned this this kind of dumbing down uh, of things. Do you think that that is kind of a natural result of uh, kind of taking the supernatural element out of out of um, really the the entire worldview and just kind of having this purely materialistic, this purely uh, just just natural viewpoint of everything? Doesn't that kind of just naturally tend to just dumb everything oh, down? Oh, uh, clearly dumb. Yes, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. yeah, and it eviscerates you know, the certainly the Catholic religion, right? Um, I mean, if you took the supernatural out of the Catholic faith, what would you have left? Nothing. Francis. Yeah. <laughs> you'd, you'd have this. That's all you'd have. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you wouldn't, but you wouldn't have Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd have Christ instead of Francis. Mm -hmm. So where do we go from here, Father, with this encyclical? What should our response to this be? I think we should just take it as another uh, proof positive that Francis is not a Catholic yeah. and uh, that the Novus Ordo is a monstrosity. It's a modernist monstrosity as St. Pius X condemned it in 1907 and uh, that we must not in any way follow it, must absolutely reject it and hold fast to the traditional faith and practice the traditional Catholic religion in its integrity, you know, yeah. not compromising. You know, when something like this comes out, which is such a blatant statement of just anti-Catholicism, just what it is, it's not just non-Catholic, it is, it is really anti-Catholicism, is what it is. Um, it's, I mean, how, you know, it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to really appreciate the significance of that. This is meant to replace Catholicism. Okay, it's not just meant as a rival, it's meant to replace it. It's the new it order. couldn't be more anti-Catholic, yeah. you know, in the sense that it intends to annihilate Catholicism in the hearts and minds of the people. So um, when people think that they can practice the traditional faith and the traditional, traditional Catholic religion within the Novus Ordo by going to the indult masses, Samorum Pontifica masses, or whatever else they, they, the Novus Ordo offers, uh, people are deluding themselves that they can actually practice the traditional Catholic faith within the Novus Ordo. And as I mentioned, they're admitting the, the fundamental principle of modernism and even trying to do that. And saying you can have multiple religions in the same church. You can have multiple faiths in the same, multiple beliefs in the same church. Well, that's what ecumenism is all about. And that's the basic bedrock principle of ecumenism, of modernism, and even its conception of faith. So you have these people who want the traditional Catholic faith they want to practice the traditional Catholic religion, and they, they answer the, the siren call there, or the, the Pied Piper's piping of the Novus Ordo, saying, oh, you can do that here within the diocese, with our, our diocesan, diocesan churches, within our, with our diocesan priests. And they, they go, and that's what they, they think they're going to be doing there. But in fact, by the very fact that they're going there, they're surrendering completely to modernism. By admitting the principle <coughs> that you can have multiple, even mutually contrary religions and, and faiths within the same church, it's impossible. Certainly not within the church that is, was established by our Lord Jesus Christ. Right, right. Well, Father, <clears throat> if you're up for it, I'd like to try and get uh, through some of our viewer questions. You know, we mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago that we were having issues with our with our email some of our emails <coughs> not, not not coming through mm -hmm. and we've uh, we've resolved the issue and we have found a uh, a lot a lot of emails uh, so I'd like to try and get through some of those um, really some some very very great questions um, you you briefly mentioned the elections that we have coming up and of course you don't want to get too too political I guess but this is a good uh, Catholic perspective uh, re related question here regarding the election. This um, viewer said that uh, he has uh, seen a speech where President Trump said that he would uh, actively pursue to decriminalize homosexuality within the United States. So the question is, Father, how can a Catholic vote for a president when he uh, is actively working to de decriminalize one of the four sins that cry to heaven for vengeance? How could a Catholic vote for someone like that? With, uh, with great difficulty, but nonetheless, there might be a time when it would be morally necessary to do so. Really? Well, when the alternative that is presented is someone who's already decriminalized it, 
and is pushing for the murder of millions of unborn children and doing so many other evil things um, that uh, <coughs> it might be necessary to choose on the basis of the whatever good principles, uh, up, let's say, a President Trump is willing to stand for, and hope that uh, in the course of time, the grace will be given to him to see the error of that. I mean, there's no doubt about it, that he's under the influence some, somewhat of Ivanka, his daughter and her husband. He's under the influence. It, it was made clear early on in his presidency that uh, Ivanka and her husband had a pretty, pretty hefty influence over him, especially in this area of their openness right. to uh, uh, homosexuality. <clears throat> yeah. And um, so, um, but, you know, we see uh, Donald Trump is a work in progress. <laughs> some say, well, some would say not <laughs> in progress, but we see he's a work in progress insofar as he seems to be standing more and more solidly for certain truly Christian principles, I mean, pro-life principles, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you know, for a president to come out and say that uh, every human being is created in the image of God and has a life <clears throat> that is uh, really God's, God's given life and that he owes it that to God, it's subject to God. And, um, and that back, backs it up, actually, with uh, action, with, with uh, uh, political uh, influence and so on. I mean, that's remarkable. So, um, I mean, he, he's against socialism, too, which the church has always condemned. And so we have to see uh, that, yes, there is still a failure, no doubt about it. I mean, very significant, uh, very significant failure yeah, in, his, in his view of things, very significant um, weakness and error. But nonetheless, we also have to see that, that he's, he appears to be willing to, to learn and he appears willing to respond to grace. And so we, I think we have to hope and count on that. Vote for him for the good things he stands for. Uh, for the other things that he stands for that are not good, we're not voting for those. Uh, but we are um, hoping to have the opportunity by prayer and good example to influence him in the right direction there. Definitely. Okay. That's, about, that's all we can hope for right now. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, it's better than, it's, it's the lesser of, people don't like that expression, the lesser of two evils, but the fact is, it's not abandoning the country to those who are totally depraved. Right. Yeah. Um, and heaven knows, we're dealing with a party, an entire party that seems to have just completely sold its soul, you know, um, and uh, given itself over to, um, to evil. In every way, we we see this virtually everything we stand for the entire party program. Absolutely, it's uh, not only immorality; it's amorality and anti morality, right. as we know it. Yep. All right. Uh, then another uh, political type question, Father. This viewer <clears throat> asks. Uh, she says, in the in the wake of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death. There's been many people praying for her soul. Is it contrary uh, for traditional Catholics to pray for people who die outside the Catholic Church, especially someone who on their deathbed cried out that their evil work uh, be continued? She says, uh, Pope St. Gregory the Great stated that we should pray for these people while they are alive, but not after they die. What do you think of that, mm. Father? Well, uh, one can pray for the deceased, obviously, right? Uh, one can pray uh, for the deceased if they're in purgatory, obviously, that God will release them from purgatory and help them with their temporal punishment due to sin. But, uh, you know, there's a school of thought that says God, who sees prayers at eternity, can see a prayer of the future and apply it to a soul when that soul is dying and give a grace to that soul when he or she is dying to convert at that time, even in light of future prayer. Because God sees all in eternity. Uh, according to this understanding, one could still pray for Martin Luther, for his conversion, in the hopes that God would foresee that prayer and give him the grace to convert and save his soul, you know, at the end of his life. Or Mao Zedong, or Joseph Stalin, or any of the mass murderers, you know. Um, 
I don't know the church has ever actually condemned that. I don't know the church hasn't defined it either. That God sees all in eternity, that mm -hmm. is fact. Okay, that we know for a fact. But um, that God could apply, in a sense, retroactive. Well, you can't even say retroactive. There's no retroactive in eternity, right? But could give grace in, in light of foreseen prayers for that individual. Uh, it's certainly possible. I mean, that God could do that. Um, as far as Ruth Bader Ginsburg goes, she stood for so many evil things, and militated for them, uh, brazenly militated for them. Um, I don't think it'd be wrong to pray that God would give her the grace of, uh, of conversion. I mean, we know from the gospel, God wills not the death of the sinner, but that he'd be converted and live. So in praying for that, we're, we're praying for what God himself wills. And we know that if the person is already uh, judged, condemned, and the, the graces brought by future prayers cannot be given to that soul, they're given to some soul in need, hmm. and who can't receive them. So they're, they're certainly not wasted. The charity behind them is not wasted. Uh, one might say, okay, well, the, the time and the energy and the thought that goes into praying, though, for the, that person, would that not be better directed to someone who's alive right now who needs those prayers right now? Um, one thing that comes to mind is when Our Lady told the children at Fatima to pray for sinners, uh, she did not explicitly tell them, or even implicitly tell them, to pray for past sinners who died. Uh, that I know of, you know, <laughs> but told them to pray for those sinners who are now in need, right? Even now, their salvation is, as it were, hanging in the balance. So again, um, I, I wouldn't discourage anybody from praying in light of God's mercy and uh, his uh, omniscience and uh, omnipotence, but uh, one might be... Um, better advised to pray for somebody alive who still has serious decisions to make. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, anyway, so there's nothing wrong with it in any okay. case. Right? Okay. Do you, you kind of mentioned this, Father, but do you think that we should, um, you know, follow some kind of hierarchy where we pray for the, the most important things, uh, the most mm -hmm. needed things first, and then kind of work our way down, you know, should we pray for our, for ourselves and our loved ones first, maybe for... Well, there is a, there is a hierarchy of love, right? We are bound to love, we are bound to love some souls more than others. We're bound to love all as we would love, our, as we love ourselves, right? Um, our Lord tells his apostles that they should love one another as he has loved them, which is a different, a very, very higher standard of, of love. But, um, Parents are obliged to love their children more than strangers. They're obliged to love each other, right? Husband and wife are obliged to love each other. And uh, that love, by right, by justice, is a stronger bond of love that binds them by reciprocal duties to each other. And so uh, it would be wrong for a parent to starve his own children for the sake of feeding someone else's. Mm -hmm. Um, there's even a, a primary obligation to love one's own life. As our Lord said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the standard of judging and the standard of measuring one's love. And so that's why suicide is considered the worst possible form of homicide. Because there's a primary obligation to love the life that God gave you. <laughs> and not to fling it back in his face contentiously, saying, I don't want this anymore. Um, <clears throat> so yes, th there is a hierarchy of, of uh, loves that we should have, and our first obligation, well, goes goes there. Our ultimate, of course, our, our obligation is to love God. Mm -hmm. But then God has given us responsibilities in this world, and those we have to care for, and those we have to love. Yeah. All right. And uh, by the way, yes. and, and translating that to what you were saying a minute ago, I think the implication is that, that your first obligation to pray is to pray for them. The bro to pray for those, first of all, for whom we are more responsible in the eyes of God. Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, if I may <laughs> expatiate <laughs> yes. a little bit there. Sorry. That's okay. But uh, something personal and, uh, you know, subject to criticism, I'm sure, but uh, during the memento of the living, the memento of the dead, uh, I mean, I will include in the, the thought there that uh, God would have mercy and bless 
all the souls for whom I am responsible, among the living, souls among the dead, uh, for whom I'm responsible according to justice and charity, because those, those are the two, those are the two um, kinds of obligations we have in justice and in charity. So, um, you know, I'm, what I'm asking God to do there is to have mercy upon and bless those who um, uh, I, I owe in justice. And that justice can be because of the, the fact that they're benefactors who've been a blessing to me, or the justice could be that I have done some wrong to them and owe them some um, some reparation for something I've done to them. Um, but also in charity, uh, also whenever there's a failure of charity, we have an obligation there uh, that arises from charity that is very serious. And uh, so we should all, I think we all should ask for that. Uh, that God would, uh, you know, supply the graces that would uh, meet those obligations we all have in charity and justice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Uh, well, if you're ready for this question, Father. I'm trying to avoid it, Tom, as you know, <laughs> you can tell. Okay, so. uh, let's see. He's, this, this viewer says that uh, I've recently discovered your channel on YouTube and have been binge watching your episodes with Father Jenkins. They are so good. They're such solid food, and I salute to you. Uh, my question is this. If Father Jenkins could recommend one Bible commentary, which would it be? Uh, would it possibly be, possibly be the great commentary of Cornelius uh, Lapide? Yes. Really? I would recommend Cornelius Lapide, yes. which I, I just learned is actually available online in Latin, complete, the complete uh, commentary, but also that there is a substantial amount uh, of his New Testament commentary that has been translated into English, which is also av available online. Uh, so one could, I think, without reservation, recommend the uh, scriptural commentary of Cornelius Alapide, which I just found out today, actually, from the good services of one of our good friends. Um, comes His name, Cornelius, Cornelius Alapide. Alapide means like from the stone or by the stone. Uh, lapis lapidis, stone in Latin. But uh, his name was uh, Van de Stein, or Stein. Well, stone. Okay. So that's what his, his name was actually in, I think, I guess, Dutch, really. So they just translated it, that into Latin. Interesting. So, well, who would have thought? Uh, I thought it had um, some great metaphorical <laughs> <laughs> uh, significance, but... But um, Cornelius de Lapide can be rep recommended without reservation, but also um, the Catena Aurea of St. Thomas Aquinas is also available in translation online, Complete the complete Catena Aurea. And uh, I could recommend that again and do recommend that without any reservation at all, because St. Thomas Aquinas, in this golden chain, as it's called, the Catena Aurea, gives uh, a series of... Uh, Brief comments from the fathers of the church um, uh, on just the, the various uh, passages from the New Testament, you know. So, um, actually, it goes right through the Gospels, commenting on them. So, that's another excellent source of biblical commentary. Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, let's see. Father, if you're prepared to answer this question, uh, this viewer asks if you would have any advice for a Catholic making a pilgrimage to Lourdes. He says, I'm sort of wondering how to make uh, the pilgrimage so that it is for the best. What are your thoughts? Well, I suppose if I were a democratic governor, I'd say wear masks and social distance. Right? <laughs> but obviously I'm not going to say that, right? okay. clearly. Uh, uh, I, um, I'm, I'm delighted if they can go, mm -hmm. if they can go to Lourdes now. Yeah. But um, I've heard that they had actually blocked off the access to the springs. That's what I heard. I don't know. I haven't heard anything to the contrary. But I heard with this uh, COVID-19 uh, business going on that they did that, probably to protect people. I mean, here you have a miraculous spring. 
uh, provided by Our Lady to heal, and they're going to shut it down because they're afraid <laughs> people are going to get COVID, this, this mystic virus. From, oh, the uh, irony. <laughs> yeah, oh, the irony of it all. But, um, but I, I would just say, if you're going, go out of devotion, love for God with the rosary. I, I don't think I have to tell them that. Uh, pray the rosary thoroughly and offer up everything, every inconvenience and every bit of trouble you have, no matter what it is. Anything from indigestion to border controls. Well, in the EU, I suppose if you get in, you're okay. But still, um, and any disappointments you have, offer that already in advance and reiterate that offering every single day to God because it's a pilgrimage. And a pilgrimage is something that is undertaken uh, not as a vacation, but as a service to God. And uh, it is meant to... uh, provide us many things to offer to God in terms of discomfort and uh, and patience, right? Mortification, so on. So look for that. And um, I think if you could take along a biography of St. Bernadette Subaru, a good biography uh, of Bernadette Subaru, that would be certainly worth reading on the way as well. Uh, so... Uh, I'd also recommend that you have clients back home that you're praying for, uh, especially those who cannot make the trip with you, but would if they could, and ask our Lord and our Blessed Mother to have mercy on them as well, so that you go as a kind of uh, an apostle of charity for for those who go with you. And... Uh, so uh, I guess that's where I would start. Anyway, make sure you make a good confession to a, tra- a traditional Catholic confession to a traditional Catholic priest to receive absolution, so you can receive the plenitude of graces that it offers. And no doubt there are indulgences attached to that visit too, and have the intention to gain those indulgences as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. If the person traveling is traveling alone, uh, they don't say that, do they? The person doesn't. I say that. don't. I think they are traveling as a family. If they're, as a family, yes. okay. okay. Oh, as a family. Oh, that's so. even better yet. Okay. Well, then it would be necessary to prepare the whole family yeah. for the spiritual undertaking, <laughs> and uh, they can they can use that opportunity in uh, if they're going as a family to not only edify their children but to edify themselves and. Explain to the children what they're doing, what why, mm-hmm. yeah. day by day. Yep. I hope they're not scandalized by Novus Ordo, though. The Novus Ordo has had control of these sites for a long time, and yeah. they have uh, unfortunately adulterated them with their modernism, uh, the cult of ugliness that goes into their structures. And I know in Fatima they've had Hindu, so-called priests performing Hindu rituals there, and so on. Yeah. I don't know that they've gone quite that far in Lourdes yet, but uh, be prepared for that, too, to make reparation to the Sacred Heart if they see something sacrilegious like that. Mm-hmm. Father, you uh, you mentioned the rosary, you know, we're in the, uh, the month of October, which is dedicated <laughs> to <clears throat> to the rosary. We just uh, a matter of days ago celebrated the, mm-hmm. the Feast of the Most Holy Rosary. We, we had a, a great question from a viewer who kind of references all of this, and uh, they ask, essentially, Father, how can I pray the rosary better? They say that I am able to cite the, recite the entire rosary from memory in English, Latin, and German, but it's starting to feel like I am just performing a drill when attempting to pray the rosary. Uh, and as a result, I feel as if I am getting and giving less and less each time I pray the rosary. So is there something that I can, uh, something that I can do to pray the rosary and uh, to pray the rosary better and to get more out of it and also to give more from the rosary? What can I do better? Well, it's certainly laudable and admirable so that a person can pray the rosary in English and German and Latin. But the fact is, nothing against that. One could teach... A bird, certain birds to be praying the rosary in Latin, right? Even even Latin, even biblical Greek, if they want to. You know, one could be, uh, one could get a, a machine and digitally make the sounds. So I, I think that's what our, our writer is talking about. That yes, I can make these sounds, but they don't resonate in my heart. Right? They 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 sound somewhat empty, of real content, and this is. 
part of the what the, what the uh, existentialists call the human condition. <laughs> okay. uh, in other words, what the Catholic Church would known as the consequence of original sin, the dullness of our intellects, the dullness of our will, that our, our intellects and our wills are subject to our passions, and the passions uh, don't really want to make effort. They want gratification, but they don't want effort. They want all the reward without any of the any of the effort. So we kind of naturally gravitate that way. Now, the fact that this individual is writing to you indicates that this individual doesn't want that. They, they definitely want something. Well, you know that in prayer, a sense of devotion is something we can sort of try to work up in ourselves. But we're very limited even in that what we can do there, because so much depends upon what kind of mood we're in, or you know whether we are happy, sad, whether we're uh, gratified by things that are, are happening, or find contradictions and hardships, or tired, or sick, or whatever. Um, so we can't really let our sense of devotion depend upon that, because real devotion is not what you and I can kind of, kind of whip up in ourselves. Uh, by talking ourselves into it, like having an interior pep rally. You know? Real devotion comes from God. That sense of real devotion has to come from God, and it's a grace, right? And sometimes God withdraws that grace. Why would God withdraw the grace of devotion uh, from a person so that the person may pray but doesn't feel that warmth and that closeness of God? As St. Teresa of the Child Jesus felt, in prayer, she felt the, the absence or the distance of God at times, you know. And she was a great saint. God was very close to her, and she was very close to God. At that point in her life, she was um, at the height of her sanctity, I guess, as she approached the end of her life. Because that's this is not what the, the interior life was all about. The interior life is not having that sense of devotion. Uh, if you study the interior life, uh, one of the greatest teachers of modern times on the interior life is Father Gary Lagrange, uh, Père Reginald Gary Lagrange, a Dominican writer on the spiritual life, cynical and mystical theology, uh, taught, um, echoing the words of the great fathers of the church, that the soul has to go through a certain development in uh, reaching uh, un unity with God, a union even what they call the unitive way here, where the human soul is not only conformed to God's will, meaning that one has to almost uh, command oneself to accept God's will, but where one is united with God's will so that true wisdom is in the, fills the soul and the person sees the, the, the beauty the truth, the goodness of the divine will entirely and embraces it entirely without any anything holding him back, right? And uh, this is the unitive way. Uh, but it's the end of this great spiritual progress. And the, the spiritual progress absolutely requires the dark night and the dark night of the senses, the dark night of the soul, uh, apply to the two... First, the first and second stages of the spiritual life. The unitive is the third. The first is the purgative way, and the second is the illuminative way. And just to kind of sum it up uh, and very much oversimplify it, the, during the purgative way, we are freeing ourselves from uh, the dominance of the passions, attachment to the things of the world, and uh, we are learning to live habitually in the state of grace. We are overcoming the things that drag us into mortal sin, that plunge us into mortal sin. And we're fighting this great combat in the soul. And uh, what is necessary to help purify, it's a purgative way. That means a, a pure way of purification. And should yield a soul that, who lives habitually, day by day, moment by moment, in the state of God's sanctifying grace. Okay? and uh, purge from one's life all the things that, that drag that soul into mortal sin. The, uh, the way of uh, the, the dark night of the senses, though, kind of uh, is, a, is a period of that process whereby 
we shut down the, the, the warm, sensible feelings of contentment and cheer and joy of, um, in our prayers, in our devotions. And uh, why would God do that? Why would God not only do that because, why would it be necessary for us to make progress? Because it's those very attachments, those sensible attachments that hold us back. Because in those things, we're looking for our own sense of self-satisfaction. <clears throat> if we pray because prayer gives us the warm fuzzies and makes us feel good about ourselves, then we're being held back by that. Uh, because the real motivation for prayer should be love for God, not love of self. If one gets to the point in prayer where he or she says, I'm not getting anything out of this. Gee, it used to be so much, I used to really enjoy praying. You know, maybe feel so good, and and uh, now eh, not so much. It's kind of empty. The question is, will they turn back, or will they go forward? Those who say, "Well, my whole purpose in praying is to get a kind of spiritual satisfaction, almost like a spiritual high from that," I don't get it, so I'm going to stop. It's pointless. But for someone who says, "Well," My purpose in praying really is not to satisfy myself, but it's to satisfy God. And prayer was good when I was happy about it, and it made me feel good. But if I continue to pray when it doesn't make me feel good, then it's making I'm making it clear to God, I'm making it clear to myself that what I'm really seeking is God's satisfaction, not my own satisfaction. And so I see that my prayer now is harder, but it's more important even, and more productive, than my prayer when I was looking for my own satisfaction. Because now I'm going to pray more purely because I know that's what God wants me to do. And if God gives me a certain joy from it, then that's a gift that I will be grateful for. But I won't require him to do that in order for me to pray. Uh, I will now um, learn to pray because it pleases God. Um, and that's a major step forward. So the dark night of the senses, being able to put away the things of a child, in a sense, right? And uh, put away the, uh, the milk of the child and start to be able to eat the meat and the solid food. This is what it's all about. Whether probably will give back, will we'll, we'll fall back, um, because this is no longer pleasing to them. Or they will keep going because they know, well, this is when my prayer can really be pleasing to God, because I persevere. So once they've, they've uh, made that choice and they do persevere in their prayer, um, they will find that they'll, they'll derive another kind of light in their prayer that they hadn't had before. Uh, something that goes much deeper than mere sensible satisfaction. And they'll be on their way toward the, uh, the uh, illuminative way. And uh, in the illuminative way, God actually speaks to the soul in a... In a in a more intimate way, and in a sense reveals himself to that that soul more. Um, well, I guess, you know, they, they spiritual writers use the word more in an intimate way that God uh, gives them insights in their prayers. He gives them insights into themselves, but he gives them insights into them, and they start seeing things and making connections when they are praying. They 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 they, they begin to understand our Lord better, right? His virtues, and his goodness. And they can take those things to heart and they begin to make some real serious spiritual progress. So much so that uh, the illuminative way even says that God enables them to experience um, not heaven so much, but to experience um, the presence of our Lord, of God in their soul in a heightened way far beyond the way they could in the mere purgative way. And uh, that God is uniting the soul, and that soul is uniting itself with God in a more perfect way. But even there, there's the dark night of the soul, the dark night of the spirit. Because there's still an element of selfishness in that. You know, where a soul will take delight, it's not yet purged of the ego, you know. Uh, and the soul can still be affected and influenced by lesser loves, other attachments. 
And so that has to be purified too. And so the dark night of the soul, the spirit, uh, takes enters there. The writings of St. John of the Cross are very important, but they're very obscure. Um, but the, uh, the writings of uh, Father Garrigou Lagrange are eminently clear and uh, enlightening, I would say. Okay? Mm-hmm. Now, of course, uh, Saint, uh, rather Father Garrigou Lagrange uh, bases his, his writings on the writings of St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, and the great spiritual writers. He's not contradicting them in any way. Uh, but he is explaining them in a way that you might say is, is more for rookies, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those who are still children of the spiritual life. So it's very enlightening. The Three Ages of the Spiritual Life uh, of Father Gary Grange is a very excellent read. Uh, it's, it ex- exists in summary, sort of like the, the condensed version, but one can get two volumes, uh, or often it's published in two volumes. This, uh, and the two parts give the completeness of that uh, teaching. And it, it's, for anybody who really wants to make progress in the spiritual life, it's, it's an excellent resource. Mm-hmm. And I think St. Francis de Sales wrote a lot about this, this subject, too. Yes, I yeah, remember one, Francis uh, de Sales also. One mm-hmm. line I, I think he, uh, he frequently used is that he, he said that... Uh, we rather than seeking the consolations of God, we should seek the God of consolations. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was very applicable right. to, to what you said. So. Yes, yeah, that expresses yeah. it very well. Yeah. Well, he, he certainly, as Saint Teresa of Avila and Saint John of the Cross, were saints who were certainly approaching, or very perhaps had entered into the unitive way. Right uh, now, you know, they make it clear that at no point. In this process of the progress that a soul makes, is one, you know, uh, in, impeccable, mm. <clears throat> right? We can still be influenced if we allow. If we allow that, okay. Um, and let's face it. I mean, if a soul is reaching the heights of the illuminative way and to, you know, nibbling as it were on the on the edges of the uh, unitive way, and, and that soul from that height having received such blessings and graces from God, would would then look back at the things of the world and allow himself to be distracted by them. Well, that's a great height to fall from. Really. And, you know, that would be such a rejection of so much good that had been accomplished there. But is it possible? Yes, it is. So, when you see the saints um, uh, growing older, they do not perceive themselves as getting holier. I mean, as they love God more and more, they are much more convinced of God's infinite goodness. And therefore, the shortcomings that they have and uh, all of their faults, uh, just uh, they, they see, they, they find them unacceptable uh, because they are unworthy of God. And they find the things that they might have taken for granted in themselves now, they, they find their enormities. And they say, this is unacceptable. This is not worthy of God. They, they, they blame themselves for that. But you see, this is not a bad thing, because what grows at the same time is their confidence in God. As they recognize his goodness more and more, they learn uh, more and more to rely on his goodness and his mercy than on any virtues of their own. This is one way of God preventing them from getting proud of themselves and saying like Lucifer, I will not serve. I will place my throne in the heavens. I'm so so good. You see, it's easier when when one teaches, uh, thinks to aspire to the heights of the spiritual life, uh, one always will have to deal with that pride in oneself as the Pharisees. And when a person is raised that high, God does take precautions to prevent that person from falling into spiritual Phariseeism. I mean, look, even our Blessed Lady, look at the time that our Lord left. Our Lord let them leave. The Blessed Mother and St. Joseph just let them leave Jerusalem. Uh, For all we know, he might have been watching them go out that gate with the caravan and just disappear over the horizon on the way back to uh, Nazareth, some 70 miles to the north. 
and uh, let them go, knowing, knowing that they would be suffering very much. When did you ever find Our Lady mention the gravity of her suffering? Only this, son, why hast thou done so to us? Didst thou not know that my fa thy father and I were seeking thee in sorrow? I mean, this is the only time Our Lady talks about that, or, uh, refers to herself that way. And so, you know, you, you get the message there that uh, this was very, very hard for the Blessed Mother, more than we can possibly imagine. I mean, they lost our Lord. She did not know why. She was not informed why. She wasn't even informed that it was happening. She suddenly discovered that it happened with St. Joseph. And, um, you know, you can imagine what went through her mother's heart at that point. Uh, had she failed some way, uh, you know, what for a mother, that's that's like a crucifixion right there, you know, uh, dying a thousand deaths, especially for Our Lady. You know, had she somehow failed, uh, why would why would this be done? And so she, she asked Our Lord for an explanation. And uh, Our Lord's response was simply, well, why hast thou sought me? Didst thou not know that I, I must be about my father, that's the real father, God in heaven, my father's business, okay? There's no real word for business in, in biblical Greek. It, it has a sense of, that I must be about the things of my father, more or less literal translation, uh, or concerned with the things, involved with the things of my father. So it's interesting to note that basically our Lord's reaction and response was not really giving Our Lady an answer because, in a sense, she was not really wondering why he had stayed behind in Jerusalem. She saw him talking with the doctors of the law. Uh, she certainly would understand the significance of what he was doing there. <clears throat> but the question is, why would he allow them to be in that situation that they would be suffering? I mean, why would he not have said, uh, I need to stay in Jerusalem for a couple of days. I'll, you know, you'll see why later, but just... Stay or stay here, okay? Don't leave for uh, for Nazareth quite yet. I'll, be, I'll go back with you to Galilee, but I, there are things that the fa my Father in Heaven wants me to do. He didn't say anything like that. He just let them go, knowing the suffering. And um, this is what Our Lady was bringing to him. You know, the suffering is so, uh, the suffering that that they that they'd endured. Not only hers, but Joseph's suffering as well. And uh, our Lord's response did not really say anything about that, why God did not inform Mary and Joseph of what was happening to spare them that, that suffering. God, our Lord's answer did not address that at all. He just, his answer was simply, I must be about my father's business, God's will, the will of Almighty God, the Father and I, the Son am here to do his will. <clears throat> now, this is what Our Lady was all about. I mean, when she went when she left Jerusalem to go back to, the, to Galilee without our Lord, unbeknownst to her, she was pursuing God's will every step of the way. When she found out that our Lord was not with them in the caravan, <clears throat> she and St. Joseph turned back. Again, they were pursuing God's will, as they knew it, uh, to come back. And when they went looking for him in the temple, they found him in the, in the priest court of the temple, uh, instructing the doctors of the law about about the Messiah, right? Uh, again, Our Lady was fulfilling the will of God, so all our Lord had to tell her was this was the Father's will. And immediately she accepted it, without hesitation. And I, I think um, this was permitted, not only for Our Lady's sanctification, um, in a way, in a way, uh, you know, corresponding to the... Uh, to the uh, you know the progress of the of the soul, you know, and she didn't have to go through the purgative way, of course, you know, but uh, she was constantly growing in virtue, growing in grace, and this is one way that she did, you know, by really accepting God's will, even when she was called upon to suffer, when anyone else would say needlessly, she didn't see it that way. So she saw that she was doing God's will in in doing that, and that's all she needed to know. So she didn't ask any more questions about that. And our Lord went back to, uh, to Nazareth and was subject to them, as you know, grew in wisdom, age, and grace before God and man. Um, 
But I mean, that certainly would have been a, a dark night for Our Lady that she went through. So it seems that we all that we all have to go through that to make spiritual progress. And we see, even in a sense, the dark night of the Spirit, our Blessed Lady was called upon to yes. endure that too. But she, if she had to endure it, it was uh, the source of phenomenal graces, not only for her, but for us, and also very instructive for us too. So um, I'm not sure that uh, is called for by the question, <laughs> but... <It's okay. laughs> but no, I, th I think we can end with that, Father. That uh, that definitely leaves a lot to uh, to ponder, a lot of um, a lot of material there. But uh, we covered a lot of ground tonight, so I thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. I know all of our viewers do as well. So thank oh, you, Father. Absolutely, Tom. Thank you too. Yeah, no problem. Thanks to all of our viewers for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.